This was about seven years ago on a dark stretch of road near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name, healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best and closest friends. One of my best friends, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people I've ever met. He's incredibly generous, genuine and warm, and welcoming to everyone, sometimes to a fault. I'm a female, and at the time of this story I was in my early 20s, and Cav is a guy and he was in his late 20s. Cav and I had a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. This particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I decided we would do a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and were headed back to the store to pick up Ben. In order to get back to the store, we needed to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection to get to the intersection, we had to go down a dark but short stretch of road. The intersection is well lit, always busy, and has a shopping center plaza on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it's exactly 302 feet to the main well lit and ever busy intersection. As we're driving down the dark section, Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god. Did you see that person waving? He slows down the car as I look back. No, what are you talking about? I asked. You didn't see them. There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have poor eyesight. It's dark. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cav is pulling into an empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat and is moving jackets and other stuff off the seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. No one is getting in this car. Do you understand? But what if they need- No, there's no one there. And if there were, they could walk up to the intersection. No. He agrees, but insists we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree, but realize I have no choice anyway. We circle back, and sure enough, there's a girl, roughly in her early 20s, standing alone, wearing all black. She looks disheveled and is sort of crying, maybe. Cav rolls down the passenger window halfway and asks her if she's okay. She seems off. I immediately have awful vibes from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says, with her hands over her face. It had my wallet. I literally lost everything, and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. I said, okay, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the plaza at the main intersection? We'll wait with you for the police. No, she says adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I started to freak out. She just said she didn't have a phone. She's been standing in the dark for an hour. I thought you didn't have a phone, I said. I do, but it's dead, she replied back. All of this happening rapid fire, and before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Cav tells her to get in the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza and we'll help you. Cav unlocks the door and says, no, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in the front pocket of her hoodie and gets into the car. I'm pissed, fuming. The girl's acting really weird. I remember, at this point, that I have my box cutter on me. I reach down, 
into my backpack and I'm rummaging through my stuff to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from this area, has no idea where she is, yet she tells us she grew up and lives about six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar that she could really use a drink. I thought you don't have your wallet or ID, I ask. I keep looking for my box cutter and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion and looks me in the eyes as if she's looking through me. It gives me the creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, the idiot, and keeps saying positive things trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, open it all the way and hold it in my lap. I turn my back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us she has a boyfriend nearby and asks us to take her there. She and Kev continue to talk and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket and mine remains holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, we've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol, and saying weird shit, to just wanting to get out of the car. We did not drop her at her boyfriend's house, but a few streets away in a random neighborhood, we drop her off and there's silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Calf says laughing. She could have robbed us or killed us. Yeah, idiot. I'm 100% certain, at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there's so much I would have done differently. We were lucky nothing happened. But I am positive that there was evil in that car that night. For context, I'm now 26 and I met my stalker at 14 to 15. So when I was 14, I decided to take ballroom dance classes. That was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country. There you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. In my group that consists of mostly teens between 14 to 17, there was a really tall, almost 2 meter, 21 year old guy. His name was Philip. We had a nice chat the times we danced, but he seemed weird. And because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends. I told him where I lived when he asked me. So, the stalking began. Philip would ride his bike from his home to my home. He would ask if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that for a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I was not home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very long time. At one point in time, the stalking ended for a few weeks, and Philip also didn't come to dance classes. At that time, I became part of a friend group of a boy I fancied. Unfortunately, Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend, so he was also a part of the group. They told me Philip was in a mental hospital. In the span of his stalking, Philip was in a mental hospital multiple times, and every time he was, I was glad because then I had some peace. When I was 16, my family and I had moved because our landlady had thrown us out. So we moved one town over. We lived two streets apart from my stalker. Every time Philip was out of the hospital, he would be at my house. At my father's birthday, he rang the doorbell and because my family had guests, they told me to open the door. And there he was looming over me like a dark, menacing shadow man. I told him to leave and I tried to close the door, but he blocked it, so I was standing there, afraid, begging him to leave. At one time, I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away, but my dad said, 
He's your friend, so it's your problem. So I went back to the door, and I begged and pleaded with Philip to please leave. At one point, he was crouched in my doorway. After almost two hours, he finally left, and at that point, it was obvious to me that he was a stalker and that he was fixated on me. The next day, I sat my parents down and told them that I was afraid of Philip. My dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I do not want any contact with him, so he left. After a few more incidents like that, he stopped showing up at my door and I thought we got rid of my stalker. But every time I started to live happily, starting to forget my fear of him, a letter, an email, or a gift showed up and would send me back into my fears. At 20, I was out of school, and to pass the year I had to wait to start my job. I worked in a grade school, in a voluntary after-school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two, my mom woke me up in the morning and told me to get dressed, because she called the cops. Apparently Philip was again every morning at our door, and he always asked for me. My parents didn't tell me so I wouldn't get scared again. Finally, after the cops told Philip three times to leave and he ignored them, they arrested him and he screamed and screamed my name and that he was burning for me and that the cops heard him. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I started laughing hysterically. We filed a report with the police for stalking and trespassing, but the officer said that they could not do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order, but it didn't go through. A week later, Philip had snuck into our garden, and like in a movie, he threw rocks at my window. Idiot me opened the window, but didn't see anything until it clicked. I ran downstairs and told my dad that my stalker was in the garden. Philip had made an escape. A week after that, I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again, and because we have no way of seeing who is at the door, I opened it, and there he was again, telling me that he missed me, saying that he'd peek through the blinds of the windows in the living room the past week to see if I was there. My parents weren't home. If they had been, I would have run to them, but like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway, listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend came. After my boyfriend arrived, he told Philip to leave, and he did. Philip mentioned in passing that he now has a girlfriend. After that, I didn't see Philip again for a long time. A friend of mine told me that he was taken by men in white coats because he believed that his mom was possessed by the devil. I was glad. It wasn't until two years later when I got a letter from court. I was a witness and told to attend a case in which Philip assaulted a girl. Apparently, after coming out of the mental hospital, he had a big fight with his girlfriend. He hit her and because she was so scared, she played dead. Philip called an ambulance and the police finally had something against him. After hearing he was admitted again to a mental hospital and I finally got a restraining order, he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was so glad. The restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements, he would go to jail. So, it was over. Two years ago, I also moved out of my parents' house. I'm telling this story only now because I believe I'm seeing him again, but it can't be. He doesn't know where I live and he also hasn't shown up at my parents' house, but I believe I've seen him when I leave the house. I just need reassurance that it's not him and that I'm safe in my own home. I go to university two hours away by ferry from the mainland where my family lives. 
Sometimes, on the weekends, I would go to visit them, which would require me to take a 23-kilometer bus ride to the ferry terminal. The bus ride was usually very boring and long, so I would try to make the best of it. Where I live, we have double-decker buses, and I would always sit at the top and listen to music. One Friday, on my way to the terminal, I was at the top level as usual when a man who looked to be about 40 came up to sit. I made note of his presence, but didn't think much of him other than that. He looked pretty beat up. Shaggy hair, stained brown hoodie, a silver chain on his neck. But I try not to judge. It's important to note at the time, I was 18 years old and I'm a small female. I don't ever want to have to be hyper aware or judgmental, but I was brought up to always take note of who's around me, particularly men just for safety. The man sat multiple rows ahead of me and in the beginning was initially minding his own business. I was just listening to music and looking out the window minding mine. It wasn't until part way into the trip that I noticed he'd moved one row closer to me. Weird, but whatever. Maybe his seat was dirty or something. He then proceeded to move closer and closer until he was in the seat directly in front of me. It's important to know that on the top level of the bus is only him and I. Suffice to say, I was getting uncomfortable. Still giving him the benefit of the doubt, I decided to phone a friend and have a conversation just to break the uncomfortable silence. So I text my friend, SOS, and he calls me and starts a normal conversation. It was at this point that the man decides that he wants to start talking to me. I tell my friend to hold on, and I take out one of my earbuds to hear what he's saying. He starts asking me if I know a good place to get a haircut. I say I don't. I start to put my earbuds back in when he asks what a girl like me is doing taking this bus alone. It wasn't late yet, but it was getting dark, so maybe he was just concerned for my safety I don't know. I told him I was going to the ferry terminal. I again try to put my earbuds back in. He continues on, telling me his life story. About how he was in the military, how his kids don't talk to him. Showed me his dog tag and told me he rides this bus back and forth every day. Just to have something to do. He has no intention of taking the ferry though. He's growing increasingly annoyed that I'm not reciprocating the conversation. He tells me it's quite rude to ignore people when they're just trying to have a friendly conversation. At this point, I'm starting to get quite creeped out. I politely inform him that I'm not trying to ignore him, but I'm on the phone with someone and would like to resume my conversation. This irritates him, and he asks who I'm talking to, to which I respond, a friend. He notices a male name on my phone and makes a weird face. He tells me to hang up, then asks to see my phone to find a hair salon where he can get his hair cut cheaply, which I obviously refuse. I then get up and try to move to the bottom level of the bus so that I'm not secluded with this weirdo upstairs alone anymore. My friend on the phone has no clue what's going on as I collected my stuff and start moving. He tries to tell me it's not my stop yet but I ignored him. I go down to the front of the lower level and stand near the bus until we reach the final stop. The man had come down the stairs and seated himself close by, but didn't try to talk to me further. I thought it was over, but no, it wasn't. I reach the terminal, pay for my ticket, and go to the waiting area. You can't enter the waiting area unless you have proof of a ticket purchase. Well, Guess who comes down the escalator? Mr. Dogtax himself. My heart sank. There were a couple of people in the waiting area, so I wasn't too worried about my immediate safety, but I was more worried about having to be trapped on a ferry boat with this guy for two hours. He paced up and down the walkway outside the washrooms, repeatedly checking to see if I'd moved, briefly ducking into the men's room and coming back out after a couple of minutes. He goes up and down the escalator a few times and continued to try to catch my eye, either smiling or just staring. 
I'd had enough at this point and started looking for other passengers that I could sit with for security. I see a woman in her mid-forties and my teenage instinct to seek maternal security kicks in. I bring my bag and politely ask this woman if I can sit with her. I quietly explain what was happening and this woman goes full mama bear, bless her soul. She told me she'd noticed the man too and got a bad feeling. She had two daughters around my age. She insisted I sit with her on the ferry too, just in case. The girl sitting across from us in the seating area overheard and offered her support as well. We boarded the ferry together and I didn't notice the man as we boarded. I assumed he had left the terminal as he said he never intended to catch the ferry in the first place. As we're seating on the ferry, my heart drops when I see him coming towards our seating area. The nice mom assures me she'll handle it if he dares approach us, but he notices that I'm not alone anymore and I guess decides to do a lap instead. We later saw him try to bother another young girl, but luckily her boyfriend returned from the food line and the guy took off pretty fast. For the rest of the ferry, he was just sort of lurking, checking in to see if I'd gotten up or left my group. I did not, even though I had to pee really bad. It wasn't worth it. The girl we were with eventually flags down a ferry worker and informs him of this suspicious individual. Dog Tag hightails it to the other side of the vessel. When we reach the other side, the mom insisted on walking me directly to my dad's car in the pickup zone before leaving the terminal herself. And that was the end of it, thankfully. I wish that woman nothing but wonderful things in her life. She was so kind and protective. I genuinely don't know how the evening would have played out without her. I don't know what this man's plan was, but being followed on two forms of transportation is definitely a new one for me. This kind of scares the shit out of me. I moved to Denton about a year and a half ago. I was always told it's pretty safe and I felt the same when I lived in my first house. When I moved to my new place, I didn't think it would be much different. Actually, I thought it would be safer since in my last place my roommates never, I mean never, locked the doors. In the new place, I have a roommate and a big dog so that makes me feel safer. We live in a good area where there are families around and stuff, but since I've moved here, there have been four different instances where men have come into my house and done something strange. All have occurred at night from 9pm to 3am. Number one, not one has done the same thing. The first one happened about a month into us living here. It was 3am and the doorbell rang. Who would be at my door right now? As I'm walking to the door, I can see and hear the person trying to get in. Me, terrified, I look through the peephole and see the silhouette of a guy that looks like my roommate's ex. I wake her up and tell her. She opens the door a few minutes later and the guy isn't there anymore. She peeps her head out the door and sees some guy inside of my car. She yelled out to him and he sprinted away. The second time, it's 9pm. I'm home alone. Someone rings the door. My lazy ass didn't get up to get it. A couple of minutes later, the doorbell rings again. This time I get up and no one's at the door. I open it and see two men in an SUV pulling into my driveway. They're almost all the way up to the house. Once they see me, they stop the car, put it in reverse and leave. I don't know what they wanted or were going to do, but it was weird anyway. Instance number three. One night my roommate is home alone. It's 9.30pm. The door rings. She doesn't get it. She thought it must be her Amazon package. They'll just leave it at the door. The door rings again. Confused, she gets up and looks through the peephole. There's a guy with a black ball cap on. 
He was looking down so she couldn't see his face. Can I help you? She asks. I have your Amazon package. Okay. Do I need to sign anything? No, he says. Okay, you can leave it on the ground. He ends up just standing there for a minute or so. She nervously stares back at him through the peephole, waiting for him to walk away. He eventually walks away. For about an hour after that, our big ass dog kept growling at the door. Another weird thing is that Amazon stops delivering at 9pm. Maybe he was just running late. And number four, the last but definitely creepiest. This happened last month around 1.30am. I wasn't home but my roommate was, with her new boyfriend Alex. They're laying in bed and from the corner of Alex's eye, he sees a pair of eyes in the crack of the blinds from her window. He gets up and runs outside, sees a grown-ass man in a construction vest looking through her window. The guy jumps when he sees Alex and grabs our trash cans right next to her window. He pretends to just be a trash guy, kindly taking out our empty trash cans out for us. Didn't know they had night shifts now, on Fridays. So yeah, those are my stories. I've heard there's a man the DPD are looking for. He's forcing himself into women's apartments in Denton. It's sad that I have to live in fear because I'm a target being a woman. It may sound dramatic to many, but after all these experiences I've had, on top of this guy that's been named a serial offender on the loose, I'm terrified to live alone next semester. I've never been scared of that. I'm a pretty tall, heavier woman, and I've grown up with all brothers. I thought I knew how to fight, but now I'm like, could I even help myself? I'm generally a calm, collected person, but this gives me anxiety every time I'm home alone and I hear something. Well anyway, thanks for listening to my story. If any of you have experienced anything like this around here, let me know that I'm not alone. I'm a guy. When I was 16, I had my first job as a pizza delivery boy. I'm 19 now, so it was about 3 years ago. My boss told me that I had to go up to floor 7 and door 59 or 60, one of those two, in a middle building. I remember there being three buildings. So, I went to the middle building and took the lift to the 7th floor. I knocked on the door, waited a minute. And as I was waiting, I heard a man yelling, You got this, over and over again for like 10 seconds. He opens the door and I said, Pizza for Mr. Anderson. I tell him his total. He looked drunk ass, white and dark grey messy beard, smells of cigarettes and alcohol. After I read the total, he said, Come on in and I'll grab you the money. Sir, I'm not allowed to do that and I will not allow that to happen, I replied. He then repeated, No, no, come on in, it's fine. I knew he was drunk as hell because his voice was all slurry and some words didn't come out right, but I could still manage to make out what he was trying to say. Anyway, I said for the last time, Sir, I can't go into your apartment, plus I'm a child. He then said, fine, but no, I'm a nice guy and won't hurt you. He then passed me the money. I handed him the pizza, and whilst he went into his apartment with his door wide open, I swear I saw someone looking at me from the sofa. Not him, but another guy. Anyway, he handed me the pizza and I took the lift. I went back to my workplace, which was literally across the road. I couldn't stop thinking about how creepy that was. I'm 17 but look much younger. Today I was at the grocery store and went to get some food from the salad bar and sat down. 
As I'm eating, shoveling food into my mouth at the speed of light, some guy with a food container sits down across from me without saying anything. The table was pretty small, so it was definitely weird that he just did that without asking. He was maybe 32 to 35 years old, 5 foot 10-ish, and wasn't unattractive or anything, but I was immediately on my guard. He had this weird vibe. I don't know how to explain it, other than it was exactly what you'd picture when you hear, stranger danger. As soon as he sits down across from me, he says, So, is your mom around? Now my mom was doing the grocery shopping, and I thought it was weird how he knew I was there with my mom. I mean, why not my dad or grandma or something? I realized he must have been watching me earlier when I was with my mother. I just replied, yeah, she's coming, as casually as possible. I didn't look up from my phone. I could tell he was kind of confused because I didn't say anything else and continued scrolling on my phone like everything was normal. After a minute or two, he says, this food reminds me of when I would go to ski camp, which was really random and weird. So I just said, yeah, it's pretty good, while on my phone and continued ignoring him. At this point, he was, I think, a bit confused on how to proceed with conversation. For a while, he was just staring at me creepily as I continued eating. I tried to make myself look as gross and unappealing as possible by chewing with my mouth open, slurping my water, and stuff like that. I think he was beginning to regret coming over to me. I was getting a really weird vibe from him, so I played a sound on my phone to make it sound like it was ringing and pretend to answer it and talk to my mom. While I'm on the phone, he would not stop staring at me. He eventually asks, what grade are you in? And I ignored him. Right around then, by pure coincidence, my mom comes over and we get ready to leave. She was talking to someone on her cell phone, so I couldn't tell her right away what was going on. But we got ready to go, and she accidentally dropped her change. Immediately, this guy lets out the most hysterical, maniacal, clown-like cackle I've ever heard. And he's rocking back and forth on the chair, laughing like a lunatic. My mom didn't even notice because she was on the phone. As we walk out the door, I turn around and he's still laughing loudly to himself at the table, banging on the table with his fists, goffing like I've never seen anyone do before. That's when I realized he was utterly insane. I got out of there real quick, and I hope I never see that guy again. For context, I live in the USA, in a pretty well populated apartment complex, with my building right across the parking lot from the leasing office and the tennis court. About five years ago, the office installed some fencing on the far side of the tennis court to be used as a dog park. On the other side of the dog park is just a big empty field that borders with a different apartment complex, maybe 20 yards away. Okay, so I recently adopted a dog. She's an older pup who alternates between sleeping for hours and being so hyperactive that she spins in circles just to entertain herself. I take her on walks three times a day and we always go to the park. I adopted a dog pretty recently, so I've been making use of the dog park pretty regularly. She absolutely loves running around the park, so we usually spend about 15 to 20 minutes there before going home. Now... I have an unusual schedule, so our last walk doesn't happen until 2am. This has never been a problem for us, until lockdown happened and my state issued a shelter in place order. As a result, the lights that used to illuminate the tennis court and dog park have been shut off. I still took my dog to the park and I brought a flashlight along. One night, we finished our walk and went to the park like usual. My dog had been acting a bit strange, pulling hard on her leash and making grumbling sounds. 
but once we were in the park, she was running around like normal. However, as I was standing there, huddled in my coat with the hood up because it's cold and a bit rainy, my dog abruptly stopped dead. I figured she saw a rabbit or something in the field, so I turned on the flashlight to look around, and there, in the field, there's a man. He's pretty far off but clearly walking towards us through the grass. I was a little spooked already because it's 2am, raining and freezing cold, but the man doesn't seem to be wearing a coat or hat. I immediately decide it's time to leave. I went down the length of the park to grab my dog. I hooked on her leash and jogged to the gate to leave. Once we left the park, my dog went ballistic, barking wildly and yanking so hard on her leash that she was choking herself. I turned and could barely make out the silhouette of the man bobbing up and down like he was running after us. I didn't even bother with the leash. I picked up my dog and ran for my building, terrified that she'd claw herself over my shoulder to try and get to the man. Once I got home, I bolted the door and wedged a chair under the knob. It was probably a dumb thing to do, but I felt safer knowing it was there. I curled up on the couch in my living room, watching the window and praying no one comes up, while my dog stood still in front of the door, growling every time the wind blew or something shifted outside. I told my boyfriend and roommate what happened, but neither of them seemed as spooked about it as I was. I don't know what was up with that guy, I have so many questions about the whole incident, but I'm too scared to consider what might have happened if the guy had been closer to the park when my dog noticed him. Or maybe I'm just paranoid and he was coming over to say hi at 2am in the freezing rain during a lockdown. Anyway, I'm scared to go out alone at night, so my boyfriend goes with me to walk the dog. We haven't seen the guy since, but I can't shake off the deep sense of unease that crawls up my spine whenever I think back on it. This was over 20 years ago, but still creepy. I was at an amusement park with some of my friends. And as I'm waiting in line for the roller coaster, I see a guy that has a t-shirt on that says, 68 and I owe you one. I giggled as I read it. He looks me in the face, we acknowledge each other, and that's that. I don't even think we exchanged words. The next day, I'm at home with my roommate and my roommate says, Hey, uh, you have a visitor. I go upstairs from my room and see these two guys in my house that I don't even recognize. Yes, they'd been invited in, innocently enough as I'm sure that my roommate didn't know that the guy was a stalker. I was so puzzled that I had to ask who they were and also where we met. The guy says, remember yesterday, I saw you at the park. I ask him how he knew where I lived and he brazenly admits that he followed me home. So, now he and his friend are in my house. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. I mustered up the courage to politely tell him and his friend to leave and to never come back. Luckily, my roommate was there, who was a male, so I felt like I had some backup. But then he was the one who let these fools in. They left peacefully, probably embarrassed. Fortunately, I never saw either one of them again, but I was on high alert status for the longest time after that. At my apartment building, it's all street parking. Tonight, as I was pulling in and parked, I noticed that there was this man walking the opposite direction from me, but then we made eye contact and he immediately turned around and walked in my direction. At first I thought it was strange, but then he started crossing the street and making a beeline for me. He wasn't saying anything at all, 
so I don't think he wanted money or directions. It still freaked me out, so I frantically tried grabbing my keys out of my purse and peeled out of there. What freaked me out though was that he was close enough to get to my car at that point that I made crystal clear eye contact and he looked pissed. So I drive off and circle around. I don't see the guy anywhere but decided to circle around again and look really carefully. Once again, looking all around the sidewalks and side street, he's not walking around. I start getting out of my car and see this guy coming out of an area where there's a bunch of bushes. I guess that's where he'd been hiding, and he again beelines for me. At this point, I've actually been on the phone with a really good friend of mine, who at that point says he'll drive over. Said friend looks around and walks me into my apartment, where I'm currently inside now and safe. But seriously, what was that all about? He didn't say anything threatening to me, so I don't think I can call 911. But I do think I'll try the non-emergency number when I calm down. Stay safe out there, folks. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Drakkard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.